Gary, good to see you. <clears throat> we were just noting we need to get started. <clears throat> Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for the privilege of studying the history of your church and the uh, principles of Scripture. And we pray for your special blessing this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> well, I, our lesson last time, last Monday, uh, in that we uh, introduced the Apostle Paul as the persecutor of the church, who on the way to Damascus was confronted by Christ himself. As a result, he was completely transformed. His whole purpose, everything was changed, and he became the great uh, evangelist of the church. Now, today we're going to switch gears, and I'm going back, and I want to discuss the issue of priesthood of believers, uh, and then we will uh, introduce chapter 3 of Galatians today, uh, which, Galatians 3, uh, which uh, has has to do with the priesthood of believers, and we'll discover that how that is. In the early, that is in the uh, uh, ancient Israelite church, God initially called Abraham, who was the father of Israel, you know, Isaac and Jacob, whose name was turned to changed to Israel, and of course his sons. And God made a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and his descendants. And that covenant, the nation Israel, the whole nation of Israel, was to become God's priesthood. And they were, as a nation, uh, to, to uh, proclaim his message to the world. When the Israelites had grown and had become a nation and were drawn out of Egypt, God brought them to Sinai for the purpose of conveying his covenant to them and making them his covenant nation. Now, when he got there, uh, the people said, all the Lord has said we will do. They were, thought they were ready to do it, but what actually happened was that uh, when Moses was called into the mountain and during that 40 days, they apostatized and they uh, made the golden calf and worshipped it. As a result, God actually rejected them as his people. And for a period of time, uh, the the, the uh, temporary uh, tent sanctuary that they had was taken way away from the camp. And anyone who wanted to, uh, to come to God and to seek him uh, would have to leave the congregation and go out to the tent, which was a symbol of the fact that they, were, they, had, they had violated their covenant already and actually they were under the death sentence. However, God saw fit to allow the, uh, uh, the nation to continue. They were, not, they, they were under the death sentence, but he provided a plan for them to return. And his first thing he did uh, Moses, through Moses was to call the children of Israel together and say, which Who's on the Lord's side? Who wants to stand for God? The whole nation was involved, but there was one tribe that didn't become involved. What was that tribe? Levi. Levi. And so, then Moses ordered them to go through and slay the ringleaders of those who had, had been leading into apostasy. As a result, God changed the priesthood from the whole body of Israel to the tribe of Levi and within the tribe of Levi he uh, placed 
the specific responsibility for the religious services upon Aaron and his family. But Levites would also be a part of the system, but the actual worship would be carried out by Aaron and his, and his sons. Why, why would God, after Aaron participated by constructing the golden calf, why would God give him the privilege of being the high priest? That is a question you'll have to ask God. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the question was, was uh, why did God call Aaron to be high priest when he failed to uh, stop the, the uh, uh, apostasy and actually joined in with it? Well, it shows the forgiveness of God, but it also shows that there is no uh, leader uh, who is not a, a, a sinful person who does not have to be restored to God in some way or another. But I, I gave you a quick answer on that. I have to ask God. Actually, the fact is that God has the ability to make decisions that we cannot comprehend. And uh, I've often asked myself the very same question. Uh, God does not always uh, act in what we would consider the same way. But God has principles and concepts and, and knowledge that we don't have. And so he, he, asks, uh, he acts consistently with his own understanding and knowledge, not the limited knowledge that we have. Uh, <clears throat> so what happened then is there was a change of priesthood from the whole nation to the Levitical priesthood. The whole nation was still to be representing God but they failed to have the integrity that God was calling for, and so he, he, he presented the, the tribe of Levi with the special religious responsibilities. Now, when Christ came, there was another change. Israel as a nation was given uh, uh, 400 90 years, 70 weeks, or 490 years to decide whether they would continue to be the special agency of God or not. And when Christ came, they crucified him. That was their answer. They rejected the priesthood. They rejected uh, this, and yet uh, they were still, they still had the same option as any other person. They simply were not longer recognized as God's channel of communication with the world. What God did was to transfer the covenant given to Abraham, repeated to Isaac, then Jacob, and then given and transferred at Sinai, especially uh, to Levite, Levi and, and to the Israel. But that covenant was transferred when Christ came to all believers from whatever tribe or nation, wherever they were. Peter tells us this. I mean, Peter speaks to the people and reminds them of the covenant. And this is the covenant that you'll find in Exodus, the 19th chapter and verses 5 and 6. It's almost a, a, a quote, a virtual quote. And Peter says, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, King James says peculiar people. Uh, this is New King James that we're reading from. 
that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the latter part that is direct uh, quotation from, uh, from uh, the book of Exodus. So what we have now is two transitions, the transition to Levi Levite, and then the Levitical system has lasted for 14, 1500 years. Now God has called for the transfer of his covenant from that nation that rejected him to every believer, which would include all of the Jews. Jews were not cut out of salvation. They simply were no longer the recognized channel through which God would communicate with the world. And so we find at this point, the transfer is complete. Now, I, I see I have moved ahead of my, uh, uh, here we have the, the typical transfer to the family of Aaron and then the uh, transfer. Uh, and I've, I've noticed the transfer statements, a couple of them. Hebrews is full of transfer statements showing that Christ has a better priesthood based on a better promises, a better covenant, a better tabernacle. Everything is better. As a matter of fact, that which God gave to the Israelites was only symbolic. It was a symbol of what was to come, a type of what would come. And now Christ is the high priest that Aaron represented. He is himself everything that the whole system pointed toward. He was the one. And so we have statements in the scripture, uh, such as the one in uh, Hebrews 1, 2. Now of the things which you have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne in the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. There are numerous statements in, uh, uh, in Hebrews that show the transfer from the Hebrew economy to Christ and his people uh, throughout the world. Now, I've chosen to look at this uh, portion of, of Peter's statement again, chosen by God. The Hebrews were chosen by God, but you are also chosen by God. I have been chosen. We have all been chosen. And that includes the Jews as well as the Gentiles. But now notice the symbolic language. Chosen by God and precious. This is something we need to, to keep in mind. We are precious to God. Uh, we, be, we speak about precious. We're talking about something very important. Precious metals, for instance. People spend their life acquiring precious metals, thinking that will give them a security they need here in this life. But we are precious to God. He spends his life, a life of eternity, in, uh, in seeking the pearl of great price, which to him is his people. So we are precious. He says, you also are living stones and are built up as a spiritual house, a holy what? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim his praises of him who has called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. Now I want to ask you a question. Is there a priesthood in the Christian faith? Uh, yes. All right. There are some who feel that that is a violation of scripture, that we no longer have a priesthood. Christ is the priest in heaven and there is no priesthood. That is not the Bible teaching. But the Bible teaching 
is that we who have the priesthood, that we are to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's no credit to us. And it is not a priesthood of Levite or some other thing. It's a priesthood of all believers. If you're a believer, if you're a true believer, you're part of the priesthood. If you're not a part of the priesthood, you're not a true believer. And uh, we don't have any Levites amongst us. God changed, you know, transferred from the whole house of Israel to Levite. But we do not have Levites. We do have pastors, we have leaders, but they're all a part of the priesthood. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean to say that in God's priesthood, there are no uh, degrees of authority. There are offices of authority, but there are no degrees of authority. In the papal system, which those who oppose this think that if we speak of priesthood, we must be referring to the Catholic Church. Actually, the Catholic Church is anything but a priesthood of believers. It is just the opposite. In that case, they have the Pope who is the highest, and then they comes uh, the cardinals, and then the archbishops, and then the bishops, and then the, finally the priests, and at the bottom, the people. The people have no authority. All the authority lies in the kleros, which means the officials. Uh, and this is not a term that Christ introduced, by the way. It was a term the church introduced as it entered into apostasy and as the papacy was being developed. Kleros and Laos were distinguished. Now, what does Laos mean? Laity. All right, laity. We call it laity. All right, now, is there a distinction in God's uh, plan? Is, are they uh, on some special, uh, Kleros on some special uh, plane? And divisions amongst them? No. No, we're all in the priesthood. The priesthood is not divided between kleros and laos. Uh, we tend to use the word clergy uh, because it's become common. That simply means those who are called to special uh, positions of responsibility and there are positions of responsibility but there is no uh, uh, different uh, I can't say the right word you can maybe help me hierarchy is no hierarchy thank you uh, the the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church is a direct contradiction to the priesthood of believers it's a total violation and there is no hierarchy. There may be a difference of offices. But the individual in that office uh, does not possess the authority. The authority is the authority of the office. When he leaves the office, he has no authority that anyone else has. When I was pastor, I had certain authority that was delegated to me. I had certain responsibilities, and my responsibility always determines my authority. Now, when Brother Skip came here, he came here as a teacher, as I did. He had a certain level of authority because of the office of teacher. And then, later on, he was asked to be the acting dean. Now, as an acting dean, he has two, you might say two hats. He's still a teacher. He has that responsibility. And with the responsibility of a teacher, he has the authority of a teacher. Now, I have the authority of a teacher. I, can, I have the freedom to teach you and have the responsibility because, because I have the responsibility, I have the authority. However, I'm not the acting dean, therefore I do not have the authority that he has to make decisions for this college. 
and to organize and to do certain things. That has been placed upon him. But sometime when Dr. Siebold has finished his special work, uh, probably uh, that will be a time when uh, I'm sure he will depend on uh, Brother Skip for, for you know, various things, but he will no longer likely be the acting dean. And that's why they call it the acting dean, you see. He's, just, he's standing in for someone else. And when that person is ready to come back and assume those responsibilities, then he'll have no further responsibilities of dean. He'll still have responsibilities of teacher. Now, in the church, we have levels of authority because the authority, uh, uh, there has to be unity. And in order for God's people to be united, there has to be ways in which we relate to each other and how a local church relates to the conference and the conference to the union and union to division, division to general conference. There has to be a method of doing that. And in order for people, uh, certain people to be uh, uh, able to direct, they have to give them the authority to do so. But that doesn't mean that that person has more authority. He exercises the authority of the office that he has been given. When he is no longer in the office, he has no authority that anyone else has. And there is no uh, uh, election for life. You know, every so often, every five years now, it is to begin with is every year. But offices are re are changed. In the local church, we have the uh, selection of offices every year. And the, it's, it's too uh, involved to do it yearly. Uh, the, in our early church, we started out each year, and then we went to two years, and then we went to four years. And more recently, in my lifetime, we've gone to five years, which gives a little more time for the people who were elected to accomplish their duties and, and to arrange for another election, which will be coming up again uh, before long. Let's see, this is the four, this is 2014, so next year will be, 2015 will be the time for another election. But what about the uh, royal priesthood? Why royal priesthood? What does royal mean? Well, it's a, it's a royal priesthood by virtue of the fact that Christ became a man and elevated humanity by his condescension. Yes. And what does royal mean? It means kingly. I, my name is Leroy. That actually means the king. So a royal priesthood would be a kingly priesthood. When David was called to the kingship of Israel, uh, his, his seed was to be a royal priesthood, that is Christ. Christ was to be both a king and a priest. How does that work? Well, first of all, as Gary mentioned a while ago, uh, Christ came into this world as a man. He was born uh, in what we call incarnate. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and then he lived and died uh, for us. But in becoming the second Adam, what authority did he uh, achieve? As a man, what, what authority? Now, as God, he was the creator of the world. As the God, he was the creator of the universe. But as a man, what now is he? He takes Adam's place, and Adam was given dominion, a kingship, over the whole world. So where does Christ stand? In the place of Adam. All right, now when 
Genesis plan is to be restored, but not through Adam of old, it's through the second Adam. Now, Adam was commanded to bear fruit, uh, that is, children, and they were all given the pre that is the kingly power, that is, the rulership of the earth under Adam. Of course, they would be. So, when Christ came into the world, he came to become the second Adam. Now, in Revelation th uh, 3, verse 21, the close of the Laodicean message. He says, those that overcome will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and I sit with my Father in what? In his throne. Notice there are two thrones. The throne of the earth, which Adam once had, and now the second Adam has. Now those who are faithful are to sit with him in his throne as he was faithful and continues to sit with his father in the universal throne. As divine, he is the king of the universe. As human, he is the king of this earth so that he is in, in both cases. Now, where do we sit with him? On the universal throne? No. no. We sit with him in the throne of the earth. However, we are given universal responsibilities because we are a royal priesthood and we do not cease to be a royal priesthood when Christ comes. The the whole universe, we will minister to the whole universe. And instead of the far reaches of the earth, it will be the far reaches of the universe. So that we, that our priesthood is not a temporary priesthood. And it's important for us to understand the wonderful plan that God has of elevating this world to the very center of the universe this is where he's going to bring his throne. And this is where the angels will uh, find their offices, so to speak. And we will be given a responsibility that no other being could have. And that is to reveal how God's love has, has rescued sinful, selfish, proud human beings and transform them. And that's why I'm kind of moving into a broader area, but that's why God has a plan for revealing his character through us before we're even given that special responsibility. And so we will have a chance for the 144,000 will bring to a climax the purpose and plan of God to restore man's character so that man can truly represent God to the universe and to the world. First to the world, but also the whole universe is looking on. <clears throat> but Satan is determined to destroy the church by destroying the priesthood. And I'm not talking about the papal priesthood. I'm talking about the priesthood of believers. In the Catholic Church, the doctrine is that the church is in the Pope. The Pope is the church. Therefore, whatever the Pope says is to be echoed by the members of the church. And that certainly is not a concept of the Bible anywhere. Christ is himself the head of the church. And we are to speak. When we speak and when we act, we are actually representing him. Therefore, if we are persecuted, it's like persecuting Christ because we are standing in his stead to represent him in this world. So it is a priesthood of all the believers. 
And a priesthood of all the believers requires that we humble ourselves one to another. We do not have uh, levels of authority, a hierarchical system. We have the high priest and the priesthood. We do have two levels. One is in heaven, the rest is on earth. And as Christ ministers in heaven, the Holy Spirit is in his church and in all the individuals. All who are true believers have given their bodies back to be directed by the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can prevent man from acting out the evils of the flesh, which are under Satan's control. We're under the domination of either Christ or Satan. We cannot be under both. Now, I've listed here from Ephesus to Mer Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, the churches of, of Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, Ephesus and then Smyrna, Pergamos, and so forth. During that period of time, the priesthood was under constant threat. During the time Paul was alive, during the first century of Ephesus, uh, Satan was determined to prevent the Gentiles from becoming uh, uh, involved and to destroy the Jews by getting them to enforce that which was no longer of value. When Christ came, to focus on the type was to show a disrespect to Christ. And so he did his best to destroy the priesthood from the beginning. And by the time we get to Pergamos, Pergamos is where there was, a, a, this started under, well, even under Ephesus, but especially in Smyrna. But by Pergamos period, the uh, church has now definitely become involved with heathenism. And the word Pergamos actually is perigamos, the two Greek words. Peri means about or concerning. Gamos means marriage, polygamy, bigamy, you know, monogamy. One marriage, two marriages, or, or several. So, the very word Pergamos means about a new marriage. Now the church is married to Christ. And throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament, the church is seen as the bride of Christ. But during the Pergamos period, the church married the heathen world. In other words, incorporated the heathen principles. And it was during the period of Pergamos from 331 to 538 that Virtually all papal uh, dogmas were developed, including uh, such things as hellfire and, and, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, change of the uh, ordinance of humility to that of, uh, of a blasphemous system, uh, which is called the mass. <coughs> now, that was Satan's efforts. When the Protestant Reformation began, it began with the restoration of the priesthood of believers. Christ's church could not be, begin any other way. And the one principle, the, the three principles that the Protestants agreed on was sola scriptura would be the supremacy of scripture, and sola gracia, sola fide, we're saved by grace through faith alone, and then the third is the priesthood of believers. And by the way, you cannot have a priesthood of believers, I'm sorry, you cannot have sola scriptura without priesthood of believers. You cannot have truly righteous by faith without a priesthood of believers. Because every individual has to develop faith for himself. There's no corporate faith. Or there may be the whole body might have the same faith, but it's because the individuals have 
chosen to believe. So, the priesthood of believers was the third principle of the Reformation, and uh, in my my class, uh, SDA History, I spent considerable time showing how this works. But for here, it has to be an abbreviated uh, introduction. What happened to the priesthood of believers under Smyrna, which was the Protestant Reformation? Did they continue? The answer is no. It wasn't very long before the various Protestant groups formulated their own uh, dogmas and, and they uh, actually began to persecute and even put to death those who did not agree with them. So how can you have sola scriptura when you have a, a church which persecutes those who think for themselves. Can a person look to scripture as a sole authority when, when they're subject to death itself, a persecution? No, and persecution is that means of the church to force a person not to think for themselves, but to agree with whatever the leaders. And it is a different form of papal hierarchy. But uh, what happened then was that the priesthood of believers collapsed. As a result, not only do we have many churches, but we also have a great deal of conflict. And uh, God is brought together, we'll see in church history, about Adventist history, how, how he first uh, uh, raised up a movement in, in the British Isles to restore priesthood of believers, but that movement failed because they, they incorporated false principles. And God raised up William Miller here in, in the, uh, North America to carry on his uh, reformation. And in that, in that uh, period of time, the Advent message, the priesthood of believer principles began coming back into the church. And when our Seventh-day Adventist work started and in its infancy, it started through the exercise of priesthood of believers, which were largely lost by the majority of the Advent movement. But we got together, came together. What does priesthood of believers really mean? Well, first of all, every, every believer is a, is a minister. And furthermore, every believer as a priest, part of the priesthood, is responsible for the faith, for himself. And responsible for representing the faith within the church and to carries some responsibility for the purity of the faith of the church. Therefore, not only are the members required to think for themselves, but they are to participate in the life of the church and in the decisions of the church, and each one is responsible for the purity of the faith, not just the organizers or the, the leaders. So when we first began, we began by bringing together the various believers and in prayerful study with scripture, the basis of scripture, the basis of priesthood of believers has to be scripture. We have to have the authority of God. And on the basis of the of scriptures, praying for the Holy Spirit to lead them in the study of scripture so that they would understand what the word of God teaches. And it was in such a manner that God gave us the various doctrines that, uh, that are involved in the Adventist church. It wasn't very long, however, uh, that, and God called for, uh, by the way, organization is God's plan, not Satan's. 
Satan's plan is disorganization, but if he can't destroy the organization, he'll try to use it. And what he tries to do is to use it to destroy the priesthood believers, not to build it up. But at any rate, uh, we had uh, the challenge of dealing with, uh, uh, with pre presidents and with leaders who exercised authority beyond their office and did not exercise the priesthood of believer principles which would call them, if there was a discussion, if there was a difference, that we come together and as a group seek God's presence and his direction through his word. This was God's plan and we got away from that and we began to attribute authority to the president that God never gave to any president. You understand what I'm saying? And so God gave a message in 1882 to Wagner, E.J. Wagner. That message was a message focusing upon Christ. If we had accepted that message. The message was intended to uh, to, to uh, uh, place in the dust the glory of man and to bring all glory to Christ. Do you remember what Peter said that we might give glory to the one who called us out of darkness? This was the plan for the Minneapolis message. When the Minneapolis came, message came, the leadership rejected it. The president at that time was Butler, and the Uriah Smith was uh, the editor of the Review, and and the probably the most best known, perhaps most loved uh, of the member of, of the church, but they rejected it. We have never yet truly accepted that message. And when we do, there will be a restoration of the priesthood of believers. And if there is no restoration of the priesthood of believers, there will be no real uh, acceptance of that message. So it was a message. The message itself was very simple. In one statement, it is that Christ is our righteousness. We have no righteousness but his. Whatever we may do that is good, to the degree that it is righteous, it's a result of the Holy Spirit, his special messenger uh, uh, agent, working in our minds and hearts to, to that end. But we ourselves have motives and, and, and so forth that we do not understand that cannot pass the judgment when you when that's why God in his plan is seeking to purify his people by helping us to depend fully upon the Holy Spirit and when we are fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit we will not continue to misrepresent Christ because the Holy Spirit does not do that <clears throat> now I place this little uh, thing here a partial uh, quotation and partly my own words but Ellen White spoke to Elder Van Horn who was by the way was a brother-in-law of A.T. Jones but also an opponent of the message and uh, Ellen White told him that he needed to banish his set discourses and his stereotyped ideas stereotyped you know what that means stereotyped ideas are set and you can't introduce new ideas and so forth. He was resisting the new message which would have transformed and changed his stereotyped ideas to be dynamic uh, principles. And then he says that he needs to come to the school of Christ to learn of him as a little child and that the Word of God presents the matter of church unity as a principle. Now what was he doing for true church unity? He was dividing the church. He was opposing this message. 
and in doing so was dividing the church. And uh, the <clears throat> And she said, emphasized over and over again Christ's command that we love one another. The basis of priesthood of believers is mutual love. If Christ is the high priest and we're a priesthood, then his relationship to each of us is a relationship of love. And if we are in harmony with him, we will love whom he loves. And we'll, we'll, our love will go out in all directions. It is a duty, she said, to seek unity. And I would like to say for your future reference, anytime you seek doctrinal purity without adequately and, uh, and in the same intensity seeking unity, you're in trouble. Anytime you seek unity without seeking truth, doctrinal truth, you're in trouble. So these two have to come together. If we're going to be united, we have to be united on truth. We cannot be united on anything else. But to be united on truth means that we must learn to love each other. And the problem that we face today is that so many are opposed to other people because of their beliefs. Not just opposed to false beliefs, but opposed to the, those who hold it. And if we have differences, we need to come together in love and discuss the differences and listen to each other. Those who present before the world apparent differences while they make no effort to see eye to eye by coming together as brethren to search the scriptures and with the spirit of a little child are not working in the lines of Christ's work. And his Holy Spirit will not endorse their work. This is extremely important, a principle that we need but to heed a great deal more. Those who present before the world apparent differences, well, they make no effort to see eye to eye. I guess, I guess I've just read that. But anyway, the Holy Spirit will not endorse their work. The price of violating priesthood principles has proven to be very high. We're still making heavy payments because we have not. We need the message, the Minneapolis message, but we cannot even re receive that message if we don't have the right attitudes and the right motives and the right approach to each other because that message is not a theology, it's an experience. It's teaching us how to relate to Christ and how to relate to one another. So we cannot come boxing each other and say, Lord, please reveal to me or, or think that we have the message and preaching it. We're not going to have an adequate understanding or ability to proclaim that message. In 1886, Butler wrote a book, the law, of, uh, the, the law in the book of Galatians. Now in 82, Wagner had had a vision of Christ crucified. He saw him hanging on the cross as he was listening to Ellen White's message at a camp meeting. He was suddenly lost to the, all that was around him and saw the cross of Christ and recognized that he was the one who caused him to be on the cross. And for the first time in his life, he had full assurance of being accepted because Christ took his place. Christ died for him. And when that message came to him, he was a medical doctor. But immediately he began sharing his testimony to churches in the surrounding area and uh, he became so involved in preaching this message and testifying that it wasn't very long that he decided he'd have to give up his doctoral work and be uh, give his full time to ministry which he did and he became the pastor of the Oakland church uh, and preached in many other churches. But at any rate, 
as he was preaching this doctrine of Christ focusing on Christ rather than the law. And this is the issue. The president, Elder Butler, and Uriah Smith were alarmed. And they began to oppose him. And in 1886, the president wrote a whole book of 80-some pages. He called it a little pamphlet. In reality, it's a small book. But he wrote a, 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 a message on the law in the book of Galatians. Now, do you remember that, that we began by reading from Galatians? And the emphasis I had there was that the context is obviously that of, of, of uh, ritual. And circumcision was the key thing. Well, the fact is, that's all Butler saw. That this is about ceremonial law. And uh, therefore, he drafted a whole book. In that book, he proved very clearly that the context is about the ceremonial law. There's no question about it. And I've taken time to go through uh, chapters 1 and 2. I think today we may have trouble getting through ch chapter 3, but that's my purpose. But uh, the fact is, though the context is the ceremonial law, the message that Paul is dealing with is much bigger than that. It includes the moral law. Unfortunately, Wagner decided that it was only the moral law, and they insisted it was only the ceremonial law, and that's where the conflict came in. And both actually, if they had not said only, they were both right. It was about the ceremonial law. It was also about the moral law. And which was the more important for our people? Were we dealing with ceremonial law? No. We had no conflict over the ceremonial law itself because no one was offering sacrifices. Our issue was the moral law. There was no significant issue on ceremonial law for us. But in Paul's day, there certainly was, in that transition of moving the... the uh, uh, Paul's responsibility was to move them, move the um, covenant from the Jewish church to the, to the Christian church. And there was a great deal of conflict over that that eventually cost Paul his life. Uh, but before Wagner had distributed this Ellen, he got a, a letter from Ellen White reproving him. Why would Ellen White reprove him? He was the teacher of righteousness. Why would she reprove him? Reproving him for doing what he did. There was some February 18 testimony, 1887. When he received that, he had already sent a copy of his response to Butler. And his response... He called it the gospel in the book of Galatians. Now, are both the law and the gospel there? Yes. These books need to be put together, not com the subject of conflict. Do you see what I'm saying? If the principles that Butler and the principles that Wagner presented in their books were brought together, that would have been the truth that God wanted us to have. But Ellen White reproved him, and the specific reproof was that his method was wrong. His approach, he was given, even in the very early part of the time when he began to present his message, Ellen White gave through testimonies, volume 5, in 1882, the same year that uh, Wagner began his preaching, she told, was a testimony clearly stating that no one who had any new truth should present it without presenting it first to brethren of experience and if they did not see any light in it to lay it aside. But why would Wagner have to lay it aside? 
wasn't he called of God? Did God did God give him his vision or not? Yes, of course, he did give him. Well then, if God gave him his message, why should he have to take it to the brethren? Because God's message and his messengers must be united. God does not intend for anyone to rise up in his church and to lead a group in a different direction. What was necessary, and he did not do, and Jones didn't do, they needed to go to those who were challenging them now. They should have been to them before and set before them their ideas or the concepts and their biblical reasons for it and prayed together about it. There should have been unity from the start. This was message was to bring about a priesthood, restore the priesthood of believers. But instead, Wagner failed, and Jones failed. They did not honor the principles of priesthood of believers, which means that we un understand that if we're ministers, so are others, and God has placed some especially in positions of responsibility that would carry authority with it. So we would need to go to those people and authority whose office God had established them in and, and uh, study this through with them. But what if they didn't see any light in it? It's, my, it's God's message. What, what happens then? All I can say is that when we obey God, he takes a responsibility for it. And if they didn't, he would see to it that this message would be presented anyway, even if they had to be replaced in office by somebody who would agree. But it would be done in God's way. And God's way is to work through the leadership of the church. A leadership that may go astray, but nevertheless, it's the Holy Spirit that leads the leaders. And if they cease to follow, then the church as a whole suffers. But no one in the church has the authority to become a center or to, uh, to assume authority. God himself must direct in that. Uh, I, I put here Galatians 2.16, uh, and perhaps I'll take a moment to notice it, for uh, just to get a little feel of what the first two chapters were. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Now, what law did they have? The law God had written in their hearts. The law, no, they did not have the written law. No, the, the law in their heart. Well, but the Gentiles obviously have, some of them at least, says so if they have it written in their hearts, they are law unto themselves. You see, the, the principle of Scripture is love. And the issue we're dealing here is a higher level than ceremonies. This is what I, I want to share with it. He says, if they who have no, have no law... Are, they are a law unto themselves. If it's written on their hearts, they don't understand its words, but they have its message in their hearts. The Holy Spirit can transform lives of people who have little or very little uh, understanding or knowledge. Then it says, their conscience also bearing witness. They have conscience. They've received the Holy Spirit's direction in their conscience. And their thoughts, meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to what? My gospel. What is Paul talking about? He's talking about the message that he was carrying. My gospel. Okay. Um, in chapter 3, which follows shortly, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? The truth of what? His gospel. What is his gospel about? He said, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has evidently set forth, 
crucified among you. Well, it would certainly involve the ceremony of love because every ceremony was focused on his crucifixion. So it would certainly include the ceremonies. But we've also seen already some indication that there's much more involved in it than that. Than that. This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did you receive the Holy Spirit because you obey the laws or because you believe in Christ's crucifixion for you and, and that he is your sin bearer? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect in the flesh, by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be in vain? He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does it by does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know you therefore that they are uh, which are of the same faith, pardon me, know therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. saying, In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now, there are a number of things that we can derive from this. <clears throat> One is that Abraham is given as an example. Did Abraham have the ceremonial system? Yes. Well, no, he didn't. He had a simple simple service of slaying an animal, but this Levitical system which God passed through, he had no knowledge of it. And all of the worships and the ritual, did he have circumcision when he became the father of the faithful? Romans says no. In particular, Paul is talking about the same thing. He said no. He received this by faith when he was uncircumcised. Circumcision was merely the symbol, but it also became the entry right into Judaism. So when we bring Abraham and, and the faith of Abraham, we're talking about something much greater than just a matter of ceremonial system. And so what we have here is evidence that b both were right, ceremonial system was involved, but something more is involved and something much more important than ceremonialism. It's that which the ceremonies pointed toward. Paul tells it very definitely that ceremonies couldn't save. And in fact, in this very book, uh, he indicates that, that this was the manner in which God saved even those who were under the, within the Judaism, within the faith of Israel. And Hebrews, especially in chapter 9, it shows that the Israelites from before were saved by the same sacrifice and the same basis, and that the sacrifices there did not cover them. I mean, they only pointed them to something, but did not did not uh, save them. They were saved through their faith in the coming Redeemer. <clears throat> For as many as are of the works of the law are under its curse. If you become a Jew by circumcision, then you have to fulfill all of the ritual responsibilities, and that results in a curse because you probably won't be able to keep them all adequately. Or at least if you fail to, you come under the curse. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified in the sight of God uh, by works. 
something's left out here. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that do, does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. What is the promise? The promise of the Spirit. And it is the Spirit who writes the law in the heart. So, ceremonial system was the context because the issue had to do with the transfer that Paul was even then ordered by God, directed by God to transfer to the whole Christian world. And now that's being challenged, and that's what Paul is answering the challenge. The, the Judaizers who followed Paul wherever he went, would, if whenever he raised up a new work, they would come to those people and try to confuse them and convince them they had to become circumcised in order to be true Christians. Now Paul said, no, never. If you do that, you're actually uh, teaching them that they're saved under the symbols, under the types. The Israelites themselves were never saved under the type. They were saved by that which was typified. So this was the real issue. Brethren, I speak after the men of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuls it or adds to. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. <coughs> and he says, not to seeds as of many, but as of one. All right, then what are we talking about? Whatever law is involved was the law given to Abraham. And it was to be received by faith. Now this is before the ceremonial system was ever developed. And Christ was himself the one, the seed, not, not the people generally. Anyone who is saved has to be saved in Christ. He is the seed. He's the one who provides the salvation. But no one is saved except they are in him. And in him, that's what Paul's main emphasis throughout his messages. In him we, this, and in him. In him we have life. No life outside of Christ. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But there is no life outside of him. And this I say, uh, that uh, the law, which was 430 years after, that means Moses' time, and ceremonial system cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect for us. so we've just come back again the ceremonial system was given 430 years later and undoubtedly Paul has that in mind for if the inheritance be of the law it is no more of promise but God gave it to Abraham by promise and what does he say in Romans when he asked the question, did he give it to him while he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? Paul makes a major point of this. Now, before, the promise precedes the ceremonial. Now, this, the context of the debate of Paul's day was over the ceremonial law, where the, where the Gentiles had to be circumcised. That was the real issue. And that be circumcised means the whole system. That's how you're inducted into. But he says, it was, it, it, the issue is the promise of Abraham, which, given to Abraham, which was given before circumcision. Therefore, Wagner was right. And uh, we're not going to be able to finish everything. I think, uh, I have presented these things in that chapter. Did you read chapter 8? of my book, Power of Humility. That was the assignment for today. Uh, but at any rate, um, we'll, uh, I'll, be, I'll be giving you some more communication on that. Um, chapter 8 of my book, Power of Humility, was the chapter that you were to have studied for this morning. And uh, 
So when you study that, I think I'll have to, I'm sorry that we didn't have a chance to finish this today because it's some important points yet to make, but it's time to go, and so we must go. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for loving us, for guiding us, for giving us these messages in Scripture, in the spirit of prophecy, for writing the law in our hearts and in our minds, and for sending us forth as emissaries, ambassadors to the world. Help us to be faithful in our witness. In the name of Jesus, amen.